Welcome to Brownsville Minute, a community conscious conversation and a platform that provides information, wellness, love, and unity all on the digital platform. And our goal is to try to make sure that our community residents are informed, conscious, and that we are connecting the dots on a virtual platform. The Brownsville Minute is designed for everyone. Please join us with the Brownsville Minute. Well, hello there. It is really wonderful to have you back joining us for another episode of the Brownsville Minute. I am really excited to have you join us today uh, for a wonderful episode that will help us to learn more about the importance and impact that small business has have had, but also thinking about how the economy can grow in the future even though we have been through this process specifically with small businesses. My name is Anita Pierce, and I am the owner of 11375. The Brownsville Minute is a platform where we have conscious conversations that focus on specific issues that impact residents of East Brooklyn with a targeted focus of residents within Ocean Hill, Brownsville, and also East New York. Within this platform, we gear information towards you, the resident, the small business, the community stakeholder, and those topics that are really important to you. We know that health, finance, growing the economy through entrepreneurship, civic engagement are all things that are critically important to the wealth and wellness of our communities. I am excited because we are going to be focusing on deepening our community connections, but just from the perspective of working with local businesses. We are now a year, almost a year and a half within a pandemic. And what we do know is that throughout this process that small businesses, particularly businesses of color have been impacted just like all small businesses, but there's a specific focus and impact that has happened, particularly within businesses in uh, East New York, Brownsville, entire East Brooklyn, um, and wanted to just really um, have a conversation about, you know, what recovery, recovery could look like with one of the newest members of Brownsville. I am really excited and happy to discuss with the um, executive director of the Pickin Avenue bid, Ms. Tierra Mack, who will help us to unpack and really understand the role of the bid 
in this recovery going forward. So I'm excited to welcome Ms. Tierra Mack. Welcome, Tierra. How are you? I'm doing well. I hope you're doing well as well. I am. It's so good to have you join the broadcast. So let's let's jump right into it. So you have been at the bid for a few months now. Tell us a little bit more about who you are, a little bit more about the the gifts and talents that you bring to this organization. Okay, I'm from Buffalo, New York. I moved to New York City about almost eight years ago. It'll be eight years in September. I have uh, I started a master's degree in urban planning in Buffalo. I had a family emergency, so I ultimately stopped the program, but I went on to complete the program at Hunter College in New York City some years later. Uh, the reason why I went back is because I was at the Utica station and it was the elevator was broke. And I never knew in New York City when the elevator is broken, the train station, the fire department has to come and bring the people up. I didn't know this. So I'm, it's three people in the wheelchair standing by the elevator. And I was like, I'm waiting here with y'all. So I waited there with them for the fire department to see what was going to happen because I didn't know yet what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. The fire department came. So I went home and I real and I started looking up tr uh, train stations and I realized that a lot of train stations specifically in black and brown communities do not have elevators. And when you don't have an elevator, that means that a person has to get off at the last stop that has an elevator, get the bus. And I'm like, that's our urban planning problem. And at that point, I hadn't been in planning school in like three or four years. So I was like, you know what? I need to go back to planning school. And I had an encouraging um, friend of mine who was like, why don't you just finish that degree as well? So that was the con we had this conversation at work maybe like a week before. Then that incident happened. So I plan I went back to planning school. Um, when I was in Buffalo, I specialized in economic development. When I got to Hunter... I was more into housing because that was like really what was on the forefront in New York City, affordable housing, critiquing the mayor's affordable housing plan, so on and so forth. Um, during my time at Hunter, I did an internship with 596 Acres where I did some community organizing around land access. Um, and then I did a data collection project about um, city owned property that had been sold to developers. So that was like some work I did. Mm -hmm. Later on in my time at Hunter, because the planning program is very long, even when you're transferring in credits, mm -hmm. um, it's like 54 credits, which is long for a master's degree. Oh, wow. I, um, During that time, I also was working in real estate as a project manager at a real estate development firm and going to school full time. I did a studio. And that's when I got back into economic development. My my core focus in my group was to focus on designated space, which is usually space that isn't designated for any type of use, mainly. And that could be for a business. That could be a pool. That could be a, a private owned public space. So that's how I got back into thinking about economic development as a concentration post-graduation. At the same time, it's always synergy. So at the same time, SBS was um advertising for their neighborhood 360 fellowship i was accepted into the fellowship i worked with merchants on knickerbocker avenue um i literally had no budget it was just me out there organizing with predominantly spanish-speaking businesses it was very interesting um during my time there i did a community cleanup i did a small business resource fair i did a ton of merchants and merchant engagement um i introduced businesses to each other that didn't know each other um who have been exist new 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 and old businesses business owners that didn't know each other it was a very wonderful and and great learning experience after my time as a neighborhood 360 fellow I became a policy advisor in work because I, I also have a workforce development passion as well. So I became a policy advisor in the workforce development division at SBS. So and then after that, now I'm the executive director of the Pickin Avenue bid. Wow. Can you say how much your life has aligned so far? <laughs> <laughs> You know what? And it's so interesting because you you never know how. And, you know, prior to that, like my background, I was a paralegal. I went to school. I wanted to be an attorney. I was in school wow. for legal studies. So but it's ironic how like my preparation, like my preparation in paralegal, like my first paralegal job was in immigration. And I did research at that job. Um, I learned how to file in a way that I never knew how to file before. Um, and I did a lot of research when I was in 
my master's program, all I did was research. Mm -hmm. So it was just like great preparation for the future. And you just never know what job is going to prepare you for your next steps. Um, but yes, I did have a lot of alignments in my career. Un some of it was unintentional, 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 and some of it was hyper intentional. And it's just interesting how it all came to now I'm here at the Pickin Avenue bed, ready to do what I was doing on at, um, Knickerbocker, but in a way that I could really do it because now not only do I have the a little bit of funds to do it, but I also am the the executive director. And and sometimes to hold vision in a place, you have to be in, in leadership. That is that is that is very that's so true. That's really true. So let's talk about the role of the Pick and Avenue bit um, and how you are now envisioning it to be because it may have it has been around for quite some time but since 1993 since you are here the vision is a little bit different perhaps yes it is yes it is um the picking avenue bid has done um some really great work i definitely have done some great work has hosted a ton of community events from their easter egg hunt to their um they did a holiday market last year they've always done a tree lighting they've done uh Picking Avenue summers with movies and just a lot of community facing events. During my tenure in the first fiscal year, my first priority is it is three simultaneous priorities. And when it's sanitation, which is really um getting our sanitation and our low level beautification, like that's like our tree pits, taken care of making them aesthetically pleasing and as we approach the fall there won't be, i don't think we'll do any planting i don't have it on my agenda to do planting um if we come up and get some free plants from any of the organizations that tend to give away free plants i may do some planting but really it's really just to get our tree pits weeded cleaned out possibly mulched so that when the snow falls we 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 bloom we're going to plant daffodils as well we're going to bloom in the spring with beautiful tree pits so it's tree pits and then it's worrying about sanitation through COVID, one of the things that happened was dsny um reduced their pickup a little bit because of COVID. so i'm hoping that that this this fiscal year going into the winter that pick up picks up because it's we think about sanitation and we think about the one person littering and it's really a complex system it's a system of our our private vendor it's a commercial carding for the businesses it's dsny doing their residential pickups we now have picking avenue is seeing a surge in residential on top of commercial where the residential units have always existed but they weren't occupied at since the 50s like they're going to be occupied now right. as as this as residents change and displacement happens in other nearby neighborhoods people are going to move into brownsville more they are going to live on those commercial corridors they're going to live on top of those stores and that creates another dynamic in the sanitation issue in which commercial businesses have their commercial private carding that they pay for and ds and is supposed to pick up those residential pieces but they are not always able to differentiate between the two so that's like one of the things that we're trying to work on a system so that our businesses can go ahead and and do their commercial carding and not have to worry about paying extra for residential trash getting picked up with their commercial carding and also so ds and y can pick up residential trash and not think it's commercial trash so i just want to just um i i it's so interesting that you're talking about um you know, trash and, and the, the, the beautification of the corridor. The one thing that, that I connected to immediately is the importance of wellness, right? So when you go to a space, right, when you're shopping, you don't want to see uh, garbage or dark papers anywhere. And it, and it just, it makes me think about when we go, you know, to other locations that we do not see the amount of trash. And so, you know, just like Pick an Avenue, you know, everyone, everyone knows about going to pick an avenue to shop at whatever stores are still there. And there's also new stores that, that have opened up recently. But it, it's the importance to me 
that I'm connecting is that when you go to a space, like when you're entering into a storefront to conduct business, you don't want to go over trash. And that's like kind of like something that oftentimes we may not really think about until you go until you go to someplace else and you don't see it at all. So I really appreciate you highlighting that. Sanitation is my number one priority. My second, I mean, they're all number ones, but sanitation is at the forefront. My second really is the bid to business connections. I think um, over the years, the businesses, every time a new business enters the neighborhood, it's our priority to go to that business and explain to them who we are and what we can do for them and how they should connect with us. Even before, I have, I have a business that just rented a space. He hasn't opened yet. He reached out to me before he started doing anything. And it's a beautiful, and this is why Bid the Business Connections are so important because we are a direct line of access to the Department of Small Business Services. The Department of Small Business Services has a team of people called compliance advisors that come out and have been trained from, from Department of Consumer and Affairs, Fire Department. They have been trained to walk into businesses and tell them right on the spot, no no fines, they're not an enforcement agency, but they can tell you, you need to light up your exit sign because you can get a fine for that. You need to put a refund policy up because you can get a fine for that. And I had them come out, we had a business that just opened up, a waxing studio on Pickton right. Avenue. Um, she just opened up, you could check her out on our social media, Pickton Avenue. Uh, it's uh, social media is Pickin Avenue for Facebook and uh, fa Pickin Avenue Business District for Facebook and Pickin Avenue for Instagram. And basically, you can check all our new businesses. We always post when they come to the corridor. You can check them out on our Instagram. But anyway, back to the compliance advisors. He called me before he's done anything. So he's already connected with a compliance advisor that's answering questions that he thought he was going to be able to do when his business opened. And she's like, no, you would have to do it this way. And that, you know how much money and time that saves a business, especially a new one? So I really appreciated him reaching out to us before he did anything in his business. And then again, we go out as soon as a business opens up on picking, we're there, business card, pamphlet, you know, just letting them know who we are. I will go back just in case you may have, it may slip your mind because business owners are busy. So you have to go back and tell them who you are multiple times. You, you see, um, another thing that we do is in our vendors with our sanitation is graffiti removal. Mm. I hadn't met this business yet, but I noticed that he needed some graffiti removed. So I introduced myself. I let him know that they're coming out to remove the graffiti. Once they removed the graffiti, which was a few days later, I went back to him and said, see, this is, this is what your, this is what the bid does. Keeping them in a constant state of information, receiving information from you and showing your results. I think is important when you're um, at a bid and you're supporting small businesses because it's hard to see the results and it's hard for pe businesses to quantify why you're here. What do you do for me? And I think always under always telling them and not tell them this is what I do for you, but showing them more importantly, this is what happens when you have a bid in your corridor. Um, and my last and final for this fiscal year goal is marketing in our narrative. I think Pickin Avenue is like the heart of Brownsville and it's and it's hard for people to really, first of all, the negative connotation around Brownsville, that's the first thing. And then secondly, along with the negative connotation of Brownsville, there is a negative connotation of Pickin Avenue. So what I want to do is really showcase everything that the bid has done in the past and we continue to we're going to continue to do in the future and how that is beneficial to the community overall especially the local economic development community because that is specifically what we do you know we are not unfortunately an all-encompassing nonprofit. we are a nonprofit that works with small businesses local entrepreneurs we would like to bring more local entrepreneurs to storefronts on Pickin avenue because we believe at the bid is that that is the best way to grow the corridor while keeping its cultural um its cultural competency and that is that is the beauty about when you have um small businesses that are from the community because there are there are tons of small entrepreneurs um who may not who may not ha have the resources in the beginning to to start 
a, to, to be in a storefront. However, even connecting with the bids, local bids can be beneficial in terms of resources that you mentioned. Um, what, are, what are some of the other um, programs that support the storefronts and small businesses overall within the, the community? Um, one of our, uh, our, my director of planning has a program that he built from the ground up, which is the New York Main Street program, in which businesses can be reimbursed for improving their storefronts. This is more of a, what I will say is that this this program has two folds. It's definitely more of a property owner facing um program but it, there are some renting businesses like terry mack that took advantage of this program and she has a beautiful storefront and a new gate and all of the things that you need to have an aesthetically pleasing corridor right she has one of the most beautiful storefronts right, yeah. on our corridor and that came from the main street grant program so i think the main street grant program is one um we do community cleanups we're hosting two this year one in the fall and one in the spring usually on earth day in the spring and we're looking at uh, mid-october for the fall and i'll have more information as we set it get closer to setting a date just really trying to monitor the weather the daffodil right. program just a bunch of stuff when you want to do a community cleanup right um Again, we're having a small business resource fair that is going to take place on Thursday, September 23rd at uh, Greg Jackson Center for Brownsville at 519 Rockaway. And it'll be 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, and yeah, we, we really offer basically the, the most basic service right now that we offer is just connecting with us. Because when you connect with us, I can tell you things that's, that we do for, that we can do for you and we can connect you with. Like I have... A business he wants to start doing fresh foods and he wants to be connected with the fresh food program me being in a bed i get the information to him i let him know these are the people you need to contact um i have another business that wants to do customized training which is a sbs program in their workforce development and that's up to me for him to listen to what he's telling me use my knowledge that i know of programs offered by the city and connect them with those programs so when one so if one wants to open up a storefront um on Pickin Avenue, let's say I wanted to do um I don't know hair as an example, what would be the process of one to start, you know, connecting with the bid to say I would like to open up a storefront? We actually have a page. We actually do quarterly vacancies reports. So we have actually on our website, which is pickinavenue.nyc. Uh, excuse me. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I have a scroll. I have a scroll yes, again. yes, yes. Vacantavenue.nyc. You go to our website and we do a quarterly vacancy report and it shows everything that we have vacant in the square footage. What I'm speaking to businesses about in 2021 post COVID is you really need to think about when you're get, renting a space, how much do you need to sell per day per square foot? That is how you know if you need that space or not. Because I think a lot of businesses end up in spaces that are too big, end up in spaces that are too small, end up in spaces that are just not overall a good fit for their type of business. So I think that is like really should be in their business plan. So before you even call to pick an avenue, you can call to pick an avenue big because I'm going to tell you this when you call us. You want a space on Pickin Avenue? Can you sell this a much times this square foot to make sure that you have your rent money? Are you in the next question is, are you interested in co-locating with another business? I think that is like coming to the future of what small businesses are going to look like. They're going to look like co-locating. They're going to look like, uh, you know, two or three businesses in one space. And I don't think it's anything wrong with that because that takes. When I, when I first started organizing small business on Knickerbocker, and I knew this before that because I, I have family members who have business small businesses, is that small business entrepreneurship looks like freedom to a lot of people. You would think that it's a lot of freedom, but in reality, you're working. If you have a storefront, forget about it. You're working nine to nine every day because you're trying to sell, especially if you don't, if, even if you own the building, you got to sell to pay the taxes, sell to pay the water. If you're renting, you need to be able to make that rent every month. So what does that look like? How do you give yourself as much freedom as possible while also being in a business and running a business the way that you want to? Some people want to have a small business and can't literally have a small business 
you know, forget about all the systemic stuff, but we're going to talk about that in a minute. But like, they really can't even have a true small business because they're in a space that's too big. So they're there all day. That's no way, you know, to really live your life, right? You want to. So I'm really trying to push more merchants into co location. And so that lead them. That's really them. <laughs> because the mo- the model that that I've been personally looking at, and you're right, being an entrepreneur is super dope and super amazing. Like, but it's it hard. Is. And it I don't is. I don't have a storefront. And I do that. This is my full time um thing that I do. I am eleven three seven five. I'm also someone's mama. Um, and that's, that's a small business. That's, that's awesome. Awesome. That's a house manager. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my CEO, and she tell and she, and she tells me with emphasis that you know I'm the CEO, and you have to listen to me. So I just shrug my co- my shoulders and just move on because that's what house I do. Yeah, she does it on to me all the time. But it's very mm-hmm. um, interesting um, that you mentioned about you know the fundamentals of business planning, business planning before you actually step into you know, having this storefront. Um, it's great. But I also wanted to um, highlight what you talk about, um, the the co, co, co-partnering, um, collaborating with other, um, other small businesses. It's almost like the WeWork model, right? Or other models where they have, um, you know, spaces where you're, so you rent out a large space, but it's, you know, you have multiple small businesses or artists within that particular space. It's not abnormal. Um, so no. hopefully you all are listening um, as a way to really think about within your business plans and how you can grow and scale your businesses through true collaboration. And there's absolutely nothing wrong. There's nothing that. wrong with it. I don't, you know what's interesting? It's like this, this, and it's it's capitalism that makes us feel this way, right? This like survival of the fittest and, and last man standing, like that's exhausting. <laughs> that's exhausting. And I just I wouldn't recommend it. I would recommend working with a business that's similar to yours, maybe a nail and a hair salon together. Um, maybe a, na- a nail, a hair salon, and a hair selling business all in mm-hmm. one with a makeup artist. That's mm-hmm. a beautiful co-location, a waxing studio together. Uh, you know how much I always want to go to just one place to get all those services done? And I can't. So I spend two or three days on upkeep. So for those small businesses, <laughs> this is the idea that's coming. Think about yes. it. <laughs> and you know, and not just that, like even like um, I think I think what I love about Brooklyn, I mean I love Brooklyn, but what I truly love about Brooklyn, you go to a lot of small businesses in Brooklyn, you see that they're selling cake cake boy. The the Jamaican restaurant is is cold, it's selling cake boy slices of cake. You go to um I forget what it's called. Uh, one of the places, Bergen something. It's, it's on Bergen and Crown Heights. They're selling cake, slices of cake from Docs. You know, you you. So you Docs has a spot and Cake Boy has a spot, mm-hmm. but they make sure that their cake is in places where they don't have locations. Right. And I think that that's like just another form of of co-locating. It's making, and that's what I love about Brooklyn is because people are working together to meet the end of, I love going, I love dessert. So I love going places, and especially a dessert that I know is good because I've already been to this. I've been to every bakery in Brooklyn. I swear I have. I, <laughs> I really have. I've been to every bakery in Brooklyn from like Park Slope to Bedside to like Chief's Head Bay. Like love, the, and I love bakeries in Astoria as well, but we're going to focus on Brooklyn today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love bakeries. But anyway, yeah, um, I just think that Colo, that's the way that I would go about it. They can look at our quarterly vacancy report on our website and see, you know, that there are spaces with rent prices advertised. Um, I'm also really a big proponent of people working together and buying a building together. Like, I would love to see that during my time at Pickin. I want to see some local entrepreneurs band together and buy a building together and and have three or four businesses operating out of that space. To me, like that would be, if that happens during my time and I really want it to happen, I would be really ecstatic and I would be pleased and feel like I did the right thing while I was here. And that is that is goals. That is how you create in um, economic growth, in my opinion, within when you are able to 
to you know you know what's so interesting every time i i talk or i coach um you know businesses specifically businesses of color it is entrepreneurship is in our blood right and so it's when we are taking the risk to actually do it full time or even you know develop you know while you are working full time it's not something that's not a part of our cultural history. It's really about, you know, stepping back into those things that we may have forgotten, um, but it's definitely doable. I think about, you know, places where, um, you know, Black Wall Street was developed and that was, that was, but that, but that's not abnormal. So, no. that, to, so reviving that is just something, bringing up, you know, and 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 putting a spin on history that you know um, existed. So, wanted to just move a, a little bit forward. Um, the le let's talk about legislation because I know that there are um, a number of impacts that we saw, um, particularly as we've been in this pandemic. Um, is there any legislation that you would recommend to be implemented to specifically support? the pick an avenue bid and businesses there um i wouldn't even say legislation and i want to you you said we was moving forward but i think we should combine these last two things we were talking about so it's a book called collective courage mm -hmm. written by jessica gordon it's about african-american cooperative economic thought and practice wonderful book I was also just recently an Urban Design Forum Fellow in the MWBE Worker Cooperative Fellowship, which spanned about 10 months. And we figured out, we worked, we researched, we, we put out a publication, which you can find on the uh, Urban Design Forum's website. And it's all about worker co how worker cooperatives could support MWBEs. I don't, I don't even think, I think, I think we should visit, revisit a lot of legislation that could help support communities of color overall. But I think in the economic development forefront right now is one of the things that we can do is really support worker cooperatives. I think, and, and for people who don't know what worker cooperatives are, they are worker owner businesses. And it's not like you said, entrepreneurship is in our blood because it was the only way that we could make money. White businesses did not hire black people. Black people had to start their own businesses and support their own communities. And a lot of people point to Black Wall Street, but if you really just look at Bed-Stuy, Bed-Stuy is a great example that's, that's currently was in a resurgence of it, but free gentrification happened. And now it's a lot of the businesses are having a hard time, not the businesses that own their buildings, but the renter businesses are definitely having a super hard time. Um, and I just think that that you think about um, the what is the it just slipped my mind in bed side the it's a cooperative type of it was i went to the black small business pro it was like a black history of small black businesses in brooklyn it was at the uh brooklyn historical society and it was a wonderful wonderful program and they talked all about cooperative economics and i think that is what we really should be gearing towards and we don't need legislation to gear towards that. Uh, we can get together and, and start our own worker cooperative. Now, could it be more legislative friendly? Absolutely. Could there be more lawyers in New York State that are versed in understanding worker co-ops? Yes. But they do have a program in CUNY in which they have a clinic for worker cooperatives. So I think that is really what I'm pushing towards. Like, I'm pushing towards... One thing is is communities banding together, purchasing property that they can run businesses out of. And then secondly, I'm pushing towards worker owner cooperatives. Because again, that breathes into the flexibility of having a business. That's like you having your media company and it's you, a camera person, uh I don't I don't know about media, so I guess a director. A director, yeah, yeah, yeah. you uh, audio visual person and not only are y'all doing the brownsville minute or um your business 1175 11 what is it 11, 3, 7, 11 5, 3, 7, 5, yeah. sorry 11375 oh, wow. is the business 
but you guys are also being able to because you are all working together and y'all all putting your own equity financial equity and sweat equity into the business and everybody is the boss everyone's a decision maker and don't get me wrong that is difficult Cause I try to, you know, it's interesting that I'm saying this because I really like to, I don't like hierarchy, even though I am the executive director and I'm really trying to get my staff into like, I want us to be like more like shared leadership mm -hmm. and, and, um, self-managing, you know, and I think that that's really the way that the world should really be going overall. People are tired. People are tired of being exploited at work. You know, I keep seeing people keep talking about no one wants to work because they're getting all this free money. The extra six hundred dollars got cut off months ago. People are not getting extra free money. They don't want to work because you don't pay enough. Or you don't treat them well. How about that? that too. <laughs> that, so so what does the world look like when we are all sharing the and I also know what it's like to be in the leadership position and need to breach deadlines and trying to explain to people that are your um reportees like this has to get done so we could report this out or so we can do this or that. So what does it look like to me in my mind where everyone is sharing that same pressure to get things out yeah. because they have the, as much to lose as you do or as much to gain as you do. I, I think I love that. I love I, I really love do. That. I love worker owned cooperatives. I wish it was more of them. I wish I was working at one. I wish I was a part of one right now. <laughs> you probably will, you probably will, will could create one within a bit. I hope so. I really hope too. That is that is definitely in the in the three to five year goals. And so that would be so amazing to see. It's very it's very interesting that you talk about, you know, so within entrepreneurship, the challenges that one, even though um, you're at the bid, you do see and understand the perspective of what entrepreneurs go through in hiring and creating a culture that you want to see that's different is a is definitely a challenge. It's, it's a beautiful thing once you have um, leveled those challenges in terms of how you want your business and your culture to run. Because I'm, I'm talking because I'm experiencing that right now. I just hired four people. And it's, I, I couldn't understand why am I so stressed out? Like, because it's a different, you're no longer working by yourself. You are now expanding the vision that you want and, and projects that need to be done and completed for your clients. It's not just you anymore. So it's a whole layer of things. And it's very interesting that you, you brought that up. So I appreciate that. Yes, it is. It's, it's, it's different. And I think that it, one of the things is um, why are you because managing, expecting people to self-manage is a big endeavor. Mm -hmm. And I think on the opposite end from being an employee for being an employee for a very long time is ner I think a lot of people get a lot of anxiety about meeting their boss's expectations and communication could resolve that when you ask your boss or your leader this is how I always used to say, this is how I was thinking about doing this project. What are your thoughts? Are these aligned with your thoughts? Because that that's two things. That's giving the, giving the leader the opportunity to know that you did some pre-thinking about it and that you're willing to put an idea forward, but also letting them know that if it doesn't align with how they want to see it done, that you're willing, that you're not married to it and you're willing to change. Correct. But that takes a lot of self-awareness and growth and maturity. And I think you know, and it, and it, and it takes a, a place of like, just like respect and order too. of like, they're the boss now. I may want to be the boss later. I'm not the boss now. So how do I um, learn as much as possible in this role and give as much as possible? Because the thing is, is that I always joke, I don't have to look for a job. I've been great at every job I've worked at. So I, I have people contact me all the time. Are you somewhere right now? Are you working somewhere right now? You know, everyone knows I'm here now, so I'm not getting those calls as frequently. But people still look for me to work with them because I did the right thing at a lot of places. Mm -hmm. and, not, and, not, and not only that, and connecting that to small businesses, like even with when you're creating your, um, your own culture and how you want to work with clients, that, 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 that transitions over 
into your business. I know oftentimes we may not think that, but it really does. So yeah, I, I thoroughly appreciate appreciate that. So um, what does recovery look like um, for small businesses within picking, picking Avenue Bid? Okay, so one of the things that's interesting about the Picking Avenue Bid is that because we don't have a ton of restaurants, we did not see the fallout that a lot of Brooklyn saw from COVID. We have a lot of dry good retail businesses that were esteemed um, essential during the pandemic. Uh, so they stayed open. Mm. And because people were home, they shopped in their neighborhood. So quite a few of my businesses did better than they did prior to the pandemic because a lot of people were shopping locally. Um, I think on Picking Avenue, the businesses that probably had the hardest time would be our hair salons. Our nail shops, our barber shops, but honestly, they've been back, running, packed, uh, full of people since people have been allowed to get their hair and nails done. Uh, what else? What else would I say recovery looks like? I think recovery for Picking Avenue really looks like not just a COVID recovery, but a recovery from years of systemic disenfranchisement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that people need to understand is like, I'm speaking from a local economic development perspective, but we are not the only part of the community that was disenfranchised. We're talking okay. about housing. We're talking about um, health and wellness. When you have, when you want a system to operate at its maximum capacity, that requires that every single part of the system be invested in equally or just as much. So if you if, if the government is only spending money on local economic development, but ignoring health and wellness, or ignoring food justice, we're not going to ever systemically prosper. You know, one part of the, the Brownsville picket, maybe Brownsville as a community as a whole may be doing well, but the other part may not be doing well because it's not having the same eyes on them that this other part, whether it's food justice, whether it's health and wellness, whether it's uh, local economic development, whether it's housing, all of those things need to be invested in at the same time because they were divested in at the same time. Totally agreed. I, I, that is yeah, one of the things that when you think about being a Brownsville baby and you see the changes and you wonder why, now I know as an adult. I didn't understand it like as a child and as a teenager, but now I'm clear. Um, what type of current, do you have any volunteer opportunities if one wanted to come out and support um, some of the cleanup efforts? Do you have any opportunities for available? It's absolutely. Well, when we do our community cleanup, prior to our community cleanup, we will, and I'm from my understanding, it has always had a great turnout. Brownsville always shows up to help clean up Pitkin Avenue. So we will have more information on our website and on our social media when it comes close, when we set a date for the community cleanup. I think if anybody wants to volunteer on Pitkin Avenue, when you're walking down Pitkin Avenue, throw your trash in the litter box. We have 68 receptacles along Pitkin Avenue. There should be no garbage being thrown at the bus stop. Uh, th that's the best way to volunteer is your day-to-day -day behavior on the corridor. Mm. Respecting your elders. Making room for disabled folks when they're coming down the street in wheelchairs. I think that's what I'm asking the volunteers. Volunteer your individual self to do what's right every day. But we will have volunteer opportunities for the community cleanup. It will happen in October. Information coming soon. Okay, that is really great. Um, so I wanted to, um, you know, start wrap up because I don't want to. I actually yeah. want to have you come back because okay. I think that there is some more, um, you know, opportunity on an ongoing basis to be able to share community and information, but also specifically about small businesses. Um, I wanted to do um, just some wrap up and just kind of just get your thoughts, final thoughts about, you know, any future goals, what's going to happen over the next um, three to six months um, from your perspective. And then we're going to wrap up what I call some fun, rapid fire questions that I always like to learn more about my guests. Okay. No so, problem. What's your favorite borough? Brooklyn. 
Brooklyn. You know what's so funny? Every every time I ask that question, people are like Brooklyn. Well, how dare you? Ask me? <laughs> I don't I, Brooklyn. Every single crevice of it. I love Brooklyn from downtown to Bed Side of Brownsville to Sheets Head Bay, Benzenhurst. Love, love, love everything about Brooklyn. <laughs> what do you what do you do in your downtime? Oh my goodness. I, currently I'm watching 90s TV sitcoms, rock. Um, yeah, I'm watching rock, binging rock on BET Plus right now. And you will be surprised how relevant that show still is. Mm. I I haven't watched TV in quite quite a few months now. So I I stopped watching TV for years and started watching it again during the pandemic. Yeah. I watched Seinfeld and Living Single because I was so sad that New York was mm. closed. And I and Seinfeld and Living Single brought me back to like, this is New York. We're gonna it's gonna be fine. So, yeah, I will. I will. I, I plan to watch some TV next week, but we'll see how that works out. Um, what's your favorite? What is the favorite thing that you appre like? So, outside of like doing that in your downtown, like, what is the favorite thing that you do to create wellness for yourself? Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. Um, create wellness for myself. It's a few things. One of them being, um, I love Trader Joe's. I go to Trader Joe's often. That's like my happy place. <laughs> That's my happy place. Um, I love music, podcasts. I like to read. So like I call downtime when my brain isn't that active, but I'm finding myself during rock, like writing notes about <laughs> whatever, <laughs> writing notes. So my brain is becoming active now while I'm watching TV. But podcasts, I really love. Um, and, and staying abreast in community discourse is something that I do to create wellness because it's something about being in community to me that makes me feel incredibly safe, even when community is experiencing a moment of chaos. When I know that that chaos is happening, I don't feel stressed out about it. I feel at peace knowing that it happened, it's being resolved, it's going to be resolved, and just knowing the things that led up to those type of chaotic events. It's like, okay, this is the brute. We need to we need to attack this brute if we want to stop seeing this happen. Favorite food, pizza or burgers? We had to choose. Burger, lamb burger, specifically from Chez Oscar on Malcolm X Boulevard. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great plug. <laughs> this is my favorite burger. <laughs> so I know, I know earlier that you mentioned that you do like sweets, but do you like smoothies or ice cream, or do you have a preference? Uh, da, 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 da. I drink smoothies to be healthy. I like ice cream from Van Leeuwen. <laughs> I love Van Leeuwen ice cream. I love Ample Hills Creamery. <laughs> I said we meet up for brunch. We're going to be in trouble. I love we are. I, love I already it. know where we're going when we meet up. <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. So, what is the, the legacy? that you would like to leave specifically for your family? Oh, wow. Um, I always say I want to be the person that that my little cousins, nieces saw get up. Mm. No matter what happened, I got up. Um, and I want my legacy to be entrenched in community. I do not want my legacy to be uh, elitist, capitalistic, one man army legacy. I wanted to be this lady was entrenched in community. She was the grandmother to everyone. I want that to be my legacy. My legacy. And then for my family, I want them to know that there is value in community. Yeah. And on that note, I'm just gonna close out the show. <laughs> You know, usually, usually that that is so powerful. Like to hear um, that being stated, and and I'm I'm super glad that you had taken the time out of your busy schedule to come and check out the Brownsville Minute. So, no problem. I, I'm looking forward to coming back. I definitely want to come back 
um, and share more about the bid, share more opportunities. I will definitely keep you abreast on all of our events so that you can put them on your social media, anything that you have going on. I know that your um, live show is on our social media already. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very, I'm very interested in continuing this relationship and, and being in Brownsville. I hope to ho- have, be a homeowner in Brownsville sooner or later, um, and continue my tenure at the bid until I see all of the things going in the direction that they should go. And so thank you for joining us. And so for, if you want to reach out, um, follow, like, follow, pick an Avenue bid, the website and Instagram and Facebook page is scrolling, but also um, check out the Pickin Avenue bid is located at 1572 Pickin Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. Um, are you guys open physically now? Definitely or- by appointment, definitely okay. by appointment. And I would even plug my, my work cell phone number. I don't mind people calling me. It's on my business card. It's on the website. Six- And so what we are going to do is put that information on the website, Um, but wanted to also um, mention as well that we do have grants available for uh, small businesses. Um, Please check out the smallbusinessrecovery.com where you can access information. I think Tiara came back. I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened, but yes, for 646-420-7964. Call me. Um, I'm always willing to meet, usually between 9 and 11. I love to meet people at Dennis's on Pickin Avenue to eat breakfast. It's a it's a beautiful place at price point, delicious food. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting with more people in the community and talking economic development. So thank you so much for your time. I am going to say so long to you. Um, Please again, check out the Pickin Avenue Big Like Follow on all social media platforms. And again, if you want to uh, meet um, Ms. Mack in person, please make sure that you schedule an appointment because we still are in the pandemic, but we are also still available to provide support and services to small businesses. So thank you so much. I look forward to talking with you again. Take good care. Yes. Thank you so much. Talk to you later. Okay. Bye. So we have a, an opportunity again to be able to connect locally with our local Pickin Avenue Business Improvement Districts. Um, it is really exciting to have a new executive director in place to be able to share um, new goals, new visions for the Pickin Avenue bid. And one thing that remains consistent is that at the community level, we all are responsible really for our space. And so I wanted to share um, a number of resources that we do have available. One, um, the Small Business Resource Network mentioned this before the um, senior director was on the Brownsville Met Minute. On the previous episodes, Mr. Deshaun Mars has offered um, additional support for small businesses. So please make sure that you check this out. These are free services that are available at no cost to you as a small business. I also mentioned that um, we have awareness that there are grants available between five and $25,000 that are now available through the New York State Empire Development's COVID-19 Pandemic Small Business Recovery Grant. So again, there are requirements. I always say this, make sure that you follow the requirements in order for you to take advantages of the grants that are there. Also, I am a business coach. However, you can book me through SCORE. Check out the information there. I'm at www.score.org under mentors, and you can find me, Anita Pierce. If you cannot afford my services, you can book me through SCORE. And the SBA has supported SCORE in order to be able to help you, the entrepreneur, with consulting services and to help you grow and scale your business. And you can look for me. I am available there. And so I want to thank you again for joining the Brownsville Minute. 
Um, it is really exciting when we have um, established partnerships and relationships with those within the community. And so we look forward to see you again. Join us on the next episode. Please like, share, and follow the Brownsville Minute on Facebook and on YouTube. We're also on Instagram as well. Thank you so much for joining. Bye-bye.